Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that right now you would be in the midst of us. We pray that you would bless the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth, that they would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, that you would draw us deeper into the mystery of your love. Amen. Amen. We should be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with y'all. I, I have been out for the last several weeks. Uh, it is really good to see all of your faces again. Um, I, uh, just before we get started, I want to say on behalf of our family, really thank you. Thank you all for the cards, the, the notes, the gifts. Um, some of you have been blessed by the Lord with just this amazing ability to craft a meal. Uh, and you know that about yourselves and you use it to bless the kingdom of God. And I, I appreciate that. So thank you. Uh, some of you know some other things about yourself. Father Daniel, I really appreciate the freezer meals that you bought and brought to the home. Thank you for that. Uh, double gift. Um, <laughs> No, if you're, if you're wondering what's going on, we, uh, my family just welcomed a new child. We, uh, we had a baby three, four weeks. Time is sort of a mystery to us right now, but <laughs> several weeks ago, we, we had a new baby. Uh, he's there at home, and, and so we have been uh, just taking some time as a family. Um, and it's been sweet. It, it's been good. Uh, we had uh, a young couple came over the other day to bring us a meal, and they're expecting their first baby. And this baby is our fifth baby. Um, and so we were sitting together and just chatting about, you know, it was exciting. We were talking about, you know, what they, they asked, what did you learn? You know, you're the, between number one and number five. Uh, and so I started reminiscing about when we had our first child, our oldest, Abigail. We were living in Arkansas at the time. And I remember when she was born in the, in the hospital. We were, uh, she was born in the morning. Uh, it, it had been a long uh, labor. You know, we were there for over 24 hours, I think. And, uh, and she was born in the morning. And then that whole day was just like, I mean, it was great. It was rest, congratulations. Oh, gee, she looks really cute. You know, pats on the back, that kind of thing. Uh, we got settled into the, uh, the mother and baby room. And I remember everybody left. It got to that night. And it was just like sweet and sentimental. We wrapped her up. I think Maylin and I said a prayer. As, you know, just our first night as a new family. And, um, and, and I remember thinking, this is so peaceful. <laughs> just a little face. Some of you realize, some of you know where we're going here. <laughs> we turned off the lights. Settled down to sleep, and, and what happens? Three hours later, I am wrenched from the middle of dr this sort of dreamless sleep. All of a sudden, I'm in the dark. It's chaotic and loud. There's this noise that's going off, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, there's something I'm supposed to do here, but I couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> Look here, you know, babies are a really cute picture, right? It's, it's a sweet moment. There are other things in life that wrench us out out of our dreams, out into the dark and the cold, and it's chaotic, and we don't know what's going on. We're, we're in 2 Corinthians. We've, we've been in, um, our New Testament reading has been in 2 Corinthians the last couple of weeks. We're going to be here for the next few weeks as well. You know, if, if anyone had the sort of the, the experience to be able to speak to suffering, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul's life, life was marked by a profound suffering that seemed to follow him wherever he went. In fact, and this is, I mean, think about this. This was part of his calling, was to suffer. It says in the book of Acts, you remember in the story of Acts how Paul comes to faith. He's, he's on the road to Damascus. He's taking himself into Damascus because he has hardened his heart against the gospel. And he is going to kill Christians. That's, that's his goal. And the Lord interrupts him on the way and blinds him. You think some, now it's like some justice is getting served here, right? But what happens? He, he gets carried into Damascus. He's blind and helpless. And the Lord speaks to one of his servants in Damascus and says, I want you to go and I want you to heal Paul. And the servant says, I, I love this. The servant says, Lord, I, I don't know if you know, <laughs> but we've heard things about Paul. He's not a good guy. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to what the Lord, who is love, even for Paul, says. He says, Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. How much he must suffer for the sake of my name. How's that for a vision statement? You print that out and you put it above your desk, your coworkers will be a little concerned for you. 
But suffering is bound up with the life of Paul. And as Paul goes on, this, this bears out as true. Later on in this letter, Paul is trying to summarize for them what his ministry has been like. And here's what he says. He says, five times I was beaten by the Jews. I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus the one. The, the punishment prescribed by the very law that Paul had wrapped himself up in, right? Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Danger, danger, danger everywhere. Something tells me Paul didn't have one of those bumper stickers that says, too blessed to be stressed, right? <laughs> he goes on, actually. I Believe it or not, I cut that list short. It goes on to talk about the stress that he carries at all times for the gospel. His life is a mess. And you know, Paul was the kind of guy that he was sort of a straight shooter, right? He, he rubbed some people the wrong way because he would just tell it like it was. It didn't matter. This happened with Peter, right? You know, the, the Peter, the sort of leader of the apostles, Paul gets right in his face and says, you're doing the wrong thing. Well, that had made some enemies over time. And there are people that have come into Corinth now. This is the context of the letter. There are people that have come into Corinth and said, Paul's life is a mess. And he's kind of a jerk. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, do you feel like God would treat someone like that who was doing the right thing? I, God's not blessing him. And if God's not blessing him, then maybe it's not worth listening to him, right? And this is what they've come in and they've begun to sow this kind of discord. And Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, what we call the second letter to the Corinthians, right, is ultimately his defense of his ministry, even in the midst of profound, calamitous suffering that has accompanied it. But Paul is also doing something else. Paul, ever the pastor, ever the spiritual father to these, his precious children that he has brought into the faith, that he, you know, as he says in one place, that he's midwifed into the faith, he's concerned. He says, if you follow that lie, then you've misunderstood something really important, right? He's concerned that they understand how it is that you can move through suffering within the Christian life. Paul understands firsthand the ways in which suffering can disorient us, the way in which even small pain can cause us to question reality. Think about when you wake up with a minor pain, right? Just like a toothache, right? Or your back hurts or, you know, you, all of a sudden, all of the optimism about the day is gone. You don't sleep well one night. You wake up the next day and you think, I don't, man, I don't know. I don't even like anything anymore. <laughs> right? But we do this, right? It's, it's silly. We lose perspective. Paul's not even talking about that. He's talking about profound suffering that really disorients us. And Paul is concerned that they know one day you're going to encounter this. How are you going to make it through? As I think about the life of suffering, I'm reminded of a mentor of mine uh, from college, a man named Mark Talbot. Uh, some of you went uh, during Lent, you went through with me a book on suffering that, uh, that Talbot had written. Uh, Talbot uh, is a paraplegic. Uh, he broke his back when he was 17, and he's, um, he's not been able to use his legs since. Uh, but he's a philosopher. He is a professor of philosophy. He studies suffering. And so uh, he wrote, um, he's write, written a series of books. This one is the first one. It's called When the Stars Disappear, Help, from Hope, Help and Hope from Stories of Suffering in Scripture. And one of the things he says very early on in the book is he says, um, Scripture proclaims that whatever God promises is true because he never lies. But what does God promise? In our eagerness to avoid suffering, we can be like children who think their parents have promised something when they have not. And then when we encounter suffering, this can lead us to think that God has broken his promise. But God never promised that his saints wouldn't suffer. In fact, quite the opposite. What does Christ say? The servant is no greater than the master. If they've done this to me, they'll do this to you. To expect we won't suffer, Talbot says, or at least won't suffer profoundly, becomes then a breathtaking error. 
And Paul, in, out of love for, his, for these, his disciples, who he has brought into the faith, these children of God that he has known and loved so well, wants them to understand when you encounter suffering, how do you move through it? And so he begins to lay out for them his own journey through suffering. He, he makes himself vulnerable before them so that they will understand how to move through. At the beginning of the letter, he says, I, I, don't, I don't want to deceive you about how bad it was. I despaired of life itself. I had given, I had given up hope, but the Lord brought me through it. And then he begins to walk through how that happened. And so what I'd like to do today is spend a little time walking through that process in our reading today, what he teaches us about how the gospel doesn't just do away with suffering, doesn't give a glib answer to suffering. Those are the worst, right? This sort of, well, this happened, but at least the gospel doesn't do that. That's nonsense. The gospel comprehends suffering. It gives you a frame within which you can move forward in the midst of profound suffering. So if you have your Bible with you, look with me at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. He says, as it says in the scriptures, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Now this, you know, at first blush, this looks like the most bizarre instance of proof texting in the entire Bible. What are you talking about, Paul? It's like, you know, when uh, I used to teach freshmen in, uh, at UGA, and, you know, it's like the first time that they read the plagiarism statement, and it says, like, we will kick you out if you, mis you know. And so I've had students cite, like, their mother, right? My roommate said this last night, and there's, like, a little citation for it. <laughs> Is that what Paul's doing? No, it's not what Paul's doing. Of course not. Paul's giving you, he's giving a thumbnail. He's assuming that you know the Psalms, or at least that you can go and look them up, right? And he's quoting Psalm 116. And he's, he's pointing to, he's saying, and this is not like some exegetical trick. It's literally what he says. In the same spirit that this was written, I did the same, right? I, having that same spirit, also believed. And because I believed, I spoke. So what is that spirit? What is the spirit doing in Psalm 116? Well, we have to go back and look at it. And when we do, what we find is that Psalm 116 is a psalm recounting a time of desperation. The psalmist has begged the Lord for deliverance, and now he's looking back and thanking God for that deliverance. Lord, I was in a deep pit, and you rescued me. That's the, sort of the theme of the psalm. It's much like parts of the psalm we read today. So, then we ask the question, okay, what is it? Where in the psalm does it come up that he says, I believed and so I spoke? Here it is, right in the heart of the desperation. Not on the ends, not where he says, God delivered me. Right in the middle of his desperate time, the psalmist says, here it is, I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all men are liars. That's not, that's not positive at all. That's, that's the opposite of, Paul, of positive. Paul says, I didn't lose faith. I was faithful to the Lord. And because I was faithful, Lord, I am in great distress and I'm surrounded by untrustworthy men. I feel like I'm alone, God. Now, this is really important, what's happening here. Paul's pointing out something to you that's just critical to surviving profound suffering. Do you know what comes on the heels of suffering? What comes on the heels of cataclysmic suffering? Not, not your ordinary hardship, not I had a bad, day, a bad week at work, but some, a child dying, a diagnosis that won't go away, that kind of suffering. What happens, it, it takes your breath out of you and it robs you of words. You know, as I was thinking in this past week, I was thinking about the number of you that I have known over the last year, over the last several years, who have experienced this kind of profound suffering. And you know that the first thing that happens is I am wordless. How do I even begin to make sense of this? And so I find myself voiceless. And this can be a kind of trap 
You can get lost here in this, in this silence, in this voicelessness. It can, it can go inside and, and it can freeze into a kind of depression. Paul says, I trusted in God. I believed, and because I believed, I began to speak. And what does he speak? Drawing on the words of sacred scripture, Paul begins to complain to the Lord. That's what Scripture teaches us to do. The psalmist takes his complaint straight to the Lord, straight to the one who ultimately is in charge of everything, in charge of all reality. This isn't being whiny. This isn't being you know, reactive and flighty or, or fussy, right? If, if I have a problem at work and I go and I complain to my coworker, that's me being whiny. It doesn't do any good. But if I go to the boss and I say, hey, this hurts, this is wrong. I don't, what's, whatever's going on here is not working. That's me doing exactly what I need to do. Do you know, in the Psalms, if you take the Psalms, you know, some of the Psalms are just kind of reflections. They're not really addressed to God. But most of the Psalms are prayers to God, right? They're directly addressed to God. Do you know, if you look at the Psalms that are prayers, the majority of those Psalms are Psalms of lament, Psalms of complaint, Psalm saying, God, help us. I'm in the midst of distress. When I bring my sorrow, even my complaints to God, I'm admitting that I have completely lost control. And I am turning to the only one who ultimately is in control. Why is it that we feel like we have to keep up appearances with God? Why is it when I am suffering, I think that somehow I've got to put a, fa- a smile on my face and pretend with God that everything's all right, as if the Psalms don't themselves say, you've never said a word that I didn't know already. Everything that's within you, God already knows. The Psalms say, Lord, your waves roll over me. You've put me in darkness. You've removed friend and neighbor from me. How long, O Lord, will you keep silent? The psalmist doesn't pretend with God. Even where the psalmist doesn't understand what's going on, he brings it to the Lord. Even where the psalmist has begun to doubt the goodness of God, he brings it to the Lord. Do the dead rise up and praise you, O God? Is that what this is about? He brings it before the Father, and that is an act of faith. Because if I'm talking to you, I believe that there's some purpose to it. If I'm talking to you, then I'm holding on to at least a sliver of hope that says you're listening and you care. And here's the fascinating thing about the Psalms. If these words are indeed the words of Scripture then where do they come from? Ultimately, where do the words of Scripture come from? Paul tells us in another place, all of Scripture is breathed out by God. Talbot in his book on suffering says, when we pray the Psalms to God in our distress, we are breathing back to God the very words that He breathed out to us. We're finding our breath, finding words, finding a voice within the words that God has gone ahead of us and given to us and said, here, you're going to need these. But there's more than that even. It, it, It gets better. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if if we stop here, you know what we have? We just have words. We have good words. We have we have healing and cathartic words, but they're just words. And God's got something more for you than just words. There has to be something that you can fix your life to. It's not enough to just know that God knew ahead of time what I was going to be feeling. I have to believe that I am loved, right? I have to believe that someone on the other end of the line cares. There there was this interesting study a couple months ago looking at um, artificial intelligence, Right, you know, there's there's all this buzz right now about language learning models and all this kind of thing. And the question really is, what can we do with them? What's the the appropriate use of AI? And so there was a team of researchers that that they were curious, can can AI do therapy? 
right? I mean, you know, it's, it would have to be text-based. It couldn't be in person, but some people have found healing that way. And, you know, it'd be really great if AI could just do therapy for us. And so they did a study where they, we've, the therapist in the room is shaking her head. No, this isn't going to work. Um, they did a study where they had people writing in, like a chat. Some of them were writing with an AI person. Some of them knew, some of them didn't, probably. Um, some of them were writing to an actual person. Here's what they found, and it's fascinating to me. When you didn't know that you were talking to a computer, people began to feel better. But the people who knew that it was just a computer on the other end of the line didn't. When they found out that they were talking to a computer, all that gain, right, doesn't happen. We have to believe that there is someone on the other end of the line. I, it's not enough to be known, I have to believe that I am loved. And so immediately after quoting the psalm, Paul says, so we believed and also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Paul is grounding himself, grounding even the words of his protest, the words of his desperation within the actual, the historical, the active love of Christ. One of my favorite lines in all of the writings of Paul comes in Galatians chapter 2. He's, he's talking about life within Christ. He says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And then it's like Paul the lecturer stops for just a second and Paul the person comes through. He says, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that pronoun there, that is so powerful. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. This is intensely personal for Paul. You see, Christ didn't just hold the other end of the line. He wasn't on the other end of the computer saying, hey, listen, I'm real. I'm a real person. I promise you. Paul, I mean, Christ stepped through reality and entered into your world. And he said, I'm all the way in and I will give my body and my blood to secure your passage to bring you safely home, to secure your healing in the midst of this pain. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you are going to survive the suffering that you will almost certainly encounter in life, you need more than words. You're going to need more than membership. You're going to need a relationship with the Christ who saved you, with the Christ who loves you. Do you have that? because otherwise it's just words. Paul says, we believed and so we spoke, knowing that we were bound up with Jesus, that he had paid with his blood to ensure that wherever he went, we would go with him. And so this brings us to the third and the, the final part of what Paul is telling us in this passage. The third theme in Paul's discussion of surviving horrific suffering. He says, you have to know where you are going. Verse 17, this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. This light momentary affliction. How do you like that? I, I've been beaten five times. I've been left adrift in the middle of the ocean. This light momentary affliction is doing something. It's being used for some end. It's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. Here's a, way to, here's a way to think about what Paul's doing here. Throughout this letter, intermittently, Paul has been talking about the glory of God. And here's the definition he's working with. The glory of God is God's presence in the midst of his people. God dwelling with his people. And so he talks about God's presence on the mountain with Moses. And he alludes to God's presence with Adam in Eden. And in a little bit, he's going to mention the tabernacle, and refer, you know, a reference to God being right in the center of the encampment of his people. All of this is the glory of God, the glory that Paul says each time he brings it up, this is where you are going. The trajectory of your life is a deeper, more intimate relationship with the one who is the source of all reality. What does this mean for us? Well, Here's a way to think about it. You live your life according to stories, right? 
We live our lives according to all sorts of little stories, right? I wake up in the morning, I tell myself a story about being able to take a shower and get breakfast, you know, and, and make it to work on time. Lately, I've been telling myself a story about being able to go to bed at night and sleep through the night. <laughs> you tell yourself stories about what the week is going to be like in the month, in the year, in the next 10 years. We tell ourselves stories about our children and about success and about what life is going to look like and the kind of person that we are. And what does suffering do? It shatters those stories. It shatters our whole perception that we can plot our way through life, that we have an idea of where we're going. It disorients me and leaves me in the dark. The psychologist Diane Langberg says, it leaves me voiceless, it leaves me alone, and it leaves me without a way forward. But here's the thing that Paul says, what it means to survive suffering as a Christian is to realize that your life is bound up within a bigger story. Paul had a story that he was living into, right? When he was on the road to Damascus, he had a story about who God was, and he had a story about ushering in the kingdom through his own force of will and through violence. And Christ reached in and blinded him. I will not leave you to the tyranny of these petty stories. In the midst of your suffering, the Holy Spirit is drawing you into that deeper reality. Let me change the metaphor here. Throughout Scripture, uh, one of the themes, one of the metaphors Scripture uses to talk about our internal lives is to talk about a house, right? The mind of man is the candle of the Lord searching out all of his inner rooms. And Jesus picks this up. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you'll open the door, my Father and I will come in and dwell with you, right? But we miserable creatures are only ever half-hearted in our opening of the door. We tell ourselves stories, right, about we let God into the foyer, maybe into the living room. We, we contain him there and we say, here's where you can dwell. And here's the problem with that. The Holy Spirit is the worst kind of house guest. He's unscrupulous. He'll take any opportunity he has to get deeper into your house, to find the doors that you've locked, the doors that you've forgotten about. And if suffering comes in like a tornado and it rips open walls and reveals parts of yourself that you didn't even know were there, Paul says, we know, we are confident, we trust. The Holy Spirit is using this. He's following right after to make that space livable. These light momentary afflictions are preparing you, are being used by the God who loves you to make you into a home. Paul, writing to this community that is so dear to him, is anxious that they understand how to endure Christian suffering. Where suffering robs you of a voice, breathe back the words that God has given to you. Where suffering leaves you alone and in the dark, know that you are bound body and soul to the living Christ who has made you his own. And when you find yourself without a frame, without hope for the future, hold fast to the promise of God that you have been woven into a larger story by the one who is faithful to bring you home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.